title for the sermon this morning is No Longer Under a Guardian. The law was never intended to save, nor is it an add-on to faith. God deals with us according to his promise and not according to our performance. Now, I don't usually do that, give you the rhetorical, I'm going to jab you with the same phrase over and over again, but prepare, right? Here it comes. Today is that day. Why? Because I think we need to have this emblazoned on our minds. God deals with us according to his promise, according to his grace, according to his mercy, according to his goodness. And sometimes, if not most of the time, we have a tendency to forget that. We may not forget it for ourselves, but sometimes we may forget it for others. We have an overwhelming tendency to look at a passage like this and not see the beauty of what it presents to us, which is essentially the phrase that I've given us. God deals with according with us according to his promise and not our performance. He wants us to see that. When Paul wrote this to the church in Galatia, he had people that you would call Pharisees that had come to faith in Christ and they took the law as an add-on and they were trying to figure out what the relationship to the law is. And, and that made perfect sense to the Jewish mind, but none of us grew up Jewish here. However, we did grow up in the Western world. And there's an overwhelming tendency within our culture to create its own form of law. I like to, do, I like to call it uh, do good, get good. That, that's our law. Do good, get good. Do good, get, get better. And if you're not doing good, well, you need to do better. Right? You, you need to knuckle down, double down, get after it, press harder, and that is the subtle legalistic law that our culture has. If we really look back into it, our culture is distinctly shaped by the Bible, distinctly shaped by a moral code. But growing up as a, uh, you know, a Gentile kid, not knowing that you're a Gentile kid, there's still this notion that we possess within our culture of wanting to be good and do good. Many people, most people, don't walk around going, I want to be as bad as possible. And even the guys that walk around saying, I want to be as bad as possible, still think there's an innate goodness and morality to it. There is a tendency within the human flesh to exalt and elevate itself while stomping on others and pushing them down and going, well, at least I'm better than them. Again, a subtle legalistic tendency that rests within our heart. If I'm better than them, then I'm good. The Jews did it. They kept these laws. They compared themselves to the Gentiles. They go, well, at least I'm not like that sinner. I'm doing good. And we have an overwhelming tendency to go back to that again and again, this natural law that happens within us that we don't even think about. We do it so much that it is something that the gospel needs to come in and correct in us over and over and over again. My heart needs corrected in it. One of the places that it needs corrected in is with my children. How often do I govern my children through dictates of law? And I will love you if you do good. And you will get good for me if you do good. And when you do bad, oh, is the love of the Father there? It's subtle. It's not as terribly open as I just presented it there, but it's something that I find often in my heart. When my kids are doing well, I'm naturally pleased with them. And when they're not doing well, what do I find? Well, I find frustration that they're such wretched little sinners, right? Do better, be better, kids, come on. Until I like, look in the mirror and I see that they are like blueprint copies of me doing the same things that I did and do. And all of a sudden, the law that exists, even if it's not a direct biblical law, actually condemns me. Does it not? Does that law that I put out over my children and even out over the other people in the community, God forbid, even out over the other church, does it not come right back and condemn me? Yes, it does. That's actually one of the very purposes of the law. The law was not given at a point within history to somehow bring salvation to a people. It was actually given, as we will find out when we go through the passage, as a guardian as a tutor, as a pedagogy, if you will. Something that was to instruct and lead and guide, but was never intended to save. If anything, it increased an understanding and knowledge of sin. 
The Apostle Paul deals with this in Romans chapter 5, 6, and 7. And when the law comes along, what do we want to do? Actually, we, we want to end up sinning more. The law isn't something that helps us manage our sin. The law is something that provokes our sin. And even if it's a subtle Gentile kind of law of do better, be better, of strive harder, it still is a provocation to sin. We see that in our children, and then we think we grow out of it. We think we grow out of it because we know how in social settings to not show our overt rebellion, at least most of us anyways. And yet, how many of you did it take some time when the pastor said, all right, you can take your seats? I don't know, you, you might be better than me. Because the first time I was told to take my seat in a church service, well, you can't tell me to sit down. I might just stand this whole time. Right? It's subtle. It's a little, uh, a little twinge within us. But when people tell you to do something, what is your tendency to want to do the opposite? I, I see it in people all the time. I see it in people in this room all the time. If you tell me to go light, right, I'm going left. If you say up, I'm going to say down. It might just be to argue with you. It might just be my way of saying hello. But the fact is, is it's an expression of our relationship with the law in any form of law that comes along. What do we do? Well, the law comes and increases trespass. It increases sin. So God never intended for the law to come and save us. He intended it to teach us who we are. And that if we are honest with our own hearts when we come into relationship to God's law according to His Word and we read these things, well, I don't naturally want to do these things. I did not want to honor my parents as a child. Why? Because I lied and I stole and I literally lit things on fire. Constantly. Fire was an issue in our house. Right? And I don't naturally want to be faithful to my wife. You're like, oh, Brian. Yeah. Why? Because if I so much as lust after a woman, what does the Bible tell me? Yeah, it's a serious thing. And how many times has there been a passing glance come from this man? Way too many to want to admit. The fact is, the law comes, it entices to sin, and as it entices to sin, it demonstrates its very purpose to show us our need. It should, when you realize that about yourself, rather than looking at others and going, shame on you, Brian, I thought you'd be better than that. Nope, I'm way worse than that, actually. So are you. And the law comes and helps us to realize our need. Helps us to understand, I need Jesus. And not just in the general sense of, yeah, I could do better and I want to do better, but in the sense of, I am absolutely morally corrupt without Jesus. I am not only morally corrupt, but I am enslaved to that sin without Jesus. I am in bondage and there is a master ruling over me that I can't get free from. And I can only submit unto it, which is sin and self, and the law comes and shows that. This is the purpose of the law. One of the many purposes, but it is the primary purpose, according to the Scripture. That every mouth may be stopped and the whole world held accountable to God, that we might reckon who we are. And so one of the greatest things that we could ever use is this passage today to help us to understand the promise to hold to and the nature of the law and then teach us to not exercise that law or any subsidiary form of law onto other people. This is difficult. This is a thing that takes time, prayer, and biblical consideration for how do we relate to this. But it is a starting point. We will find out later in chapter 5 Another use and another relationship we have to the law, which I really want to go into because it's almost like the yeah, but, but I don't want to erase this primary function of the law. I don't want to just glaze over it. I want to spend some time in it so that we might understand it. We'll get to chapter 5 eventually. We'll get there eventually, and we'll see other relationships to the law. But for now, what we're going to do is we're going to go verse by verse, seeing what the apostles' intentions were with those who were tempted towards legalism. And even though we are not Jews, we are Gentiles by birth, the fact is we are tempted the same 
towards legalism, even if it is, again, a lesser form of law. We can learn just as much from this as a Jew would. And when it impacts our heart in life, it helps us to see the world through different lenses that we might get to the secondary and tertiary functions of the law and use them rightly. If we just burn over this portion, the other functioning portions of the law make no sense to us and we tend to be legalists. We have to get this. Back in chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, O Galatians, foolish Galatians, who, who has bewitched you? Who has made you think that works are necessary? That, it, that it's not works that somehow caused you to be born by the Spirit. He wanted them to understand that they have been bewitched, that they have been taken by a false teaching that came and said, you need Jesus and the law. The law was an add-on. It was an add extra. He goes, no, it is not. For all who rely on works of the law are what? Cursed. Cursed. They are those who are not going to be justified since it is through the law that the knowledge of sin comes and your understanding of your rebellion against God is clear. He wanted them to get this. And then he wants to give them a human example. And this is where we start into our passage for the day. He wants to talk about the intent of the law, the function of the law, the place of the law. And he's going to give a human example of the law in its relationship to mankind. To give you a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. And so if there is a will and testament in which somebody has when they die, that is something that is going to be carried out no matter what because that person who has passed cannot come and bring any changes to it. And this is the sense in which is being presented here, a will and testament. And he's giving this as an example, pointing to the reality that God, in the past, has made a promise and has ratified the covenant, a covenant with Adam, a covenant with Noah, a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it wasn't until 430 years after the time of Abraham that the law was even given. And so why is he giving this human example of this this man-made covenant not being something that can be annulled? Because what he wants them to get is the law does not annul the grace of God evident in the promises to Abraham. You see, because the Pharisees, they'd look at the promises given to Abraham and they go, yep, sure, Genesis chapter 15 and the verses that follow point to the reality that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness, and great, God worked through faith, but then the law came. This is what the Pharisee would say, and the law is better. The law is not better. And the law does not stand in competition to the promise of faith, and this is what he wants us to get. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring, who is who? Christ. So even way back when, when the promise was made to Abraham, it was made to Christ. And then that promise comes through Christ. And we are recipients of that promise through Christ. And so as this promise was made, that promise is not annulled, by a giving of the law. The law doesn't come and wipe out the need for faith. At times, we like to think that way. That is the problem with the Jews, is they did think that way. They thought the law actually came and supplanted the need for faith because something better was there, and they, they would justify themselves. We see the apostle do that, where he talks about his pedigree. Being a Jew of Jews, being born of this clan and doing all of these great things, he had all of the, check, the, the boxes checked. He had a moral superiority. And yet all of those things are what? Rubbish. Worthless. And yet mankind, what will we do? We will hold fast to those things. 
We will hold fast to how good we think we are in comparison to other people. And all we are doing is pushing others down into the slew of the spawn that we all roll around in, happily rolling around in it together. Rather than rejoicing in Christ having taken us from that pit by nothing that we've done, by no power of our own, by no intelligence or insight that we have gained by our own fleshly means. But he redeemed us, pulled us from death, certain death, giving us his goodness and his kindness and allowing us to be those who enjoyed the benefit of the promises that were made prior to the giving of the law. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterwards, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. The law doesn't make the promises void that were given to Abraham and the patriarchs. Those promises still stand firm for God's people. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. This, my friends, helps us to understand our Old Testament. You want to know how to read your Old Testament? Look at this passage right here, study it, meditate on it, and guess what? It helps you to understand that the promises that were written at that time are also for us as well. There's an overwhelming tendency to look into your Old Testament and see this verbose old Hebrew document as dusty, as inadequate, as unnecessary, and I say, "Uh uh-uh, no, it's not. It's of great value. It's of great value to encourage your heart, not just the historical facts of the things that laid there, but you could see the faithfulness of God in the stories that are told. You could see the goodness of God in the stories that are told. You can rejoice that our God is faithful, that He keeps His promises, that He doesn't come and change His mind halfway through. I'd have changed my mind, right? I can't make my mind up on where I want to go eat, let alone in, in you know, something more significant than this. But praise God, he doesn't change his mind. He keeps faithful with his promises. This is what Paul wants them to get. This is what I believe he wants us to get. So why then the law? This is the next logical step. If the law is not something that brings salvation to us, what function does the law have? Verse 19, why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise has been made. And it was put in place through angels by intermediaries. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. God put the law in place on purpose. Yes, he used his means to get it there. Yes, he, he had the different actors involved in putting it down. But God singularly put the law into faith. Why? Because of transgressions. I believe it is to show us our transgressions. If you go back to Romans chapter 7, what does he say? He didn't know what coveting was until there was a command about coveting. And when coveting came along, he couldn't stop but covet. This is what the law does. It comes because there are transgressions, because there are running away from God, and because there is this arrogant self-presumption amongst mankind that we are good enough. We compare ourselves amongst ourselves. We think we're good enough. What the law shows us is, no, you're not. No, we are not. We are not good enough. There's nothing we can do. And God gave this law, not as a thing contrary to the promise of God, but to stand compatibly with the promise of God. It is the law, verse 21. It is the law. Is the law then contrary to the promise of God? Certainly not. For if the law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the law never served that function, friends. It was never intended that by God. The gospel of Jesus Christ didn't come along. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ didn't come along to somehow make up for a deficiency in the law that God somehow was like, oh, geez, I guess the law didn't work out for these guys. No, no, no. The law had always been intended by God to serve this function, and it compatibly sits with God's promise. God's mercy and grace is seen all the way through the giving of the law. Yet what do we see after the law is giving? It seems like Israel collectively loses their mind, and they just become a bunch of sinful reprobates. Haven't you ever wondered about that? 
Like, here, have this law, and Israel just goes down the slide. Right into the pit. I think the reason that that happened was, again, to demonstrate there's a need for mercy. There's a need for grace. There's a need for God's goodness. There's a need for redemption that we cannot provide on our own. The law is not contrary to the promise of God. But Scripture imprisoned everything under the law so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So, let's go back. The promise was given to offspring, not offsprings. This offspring is Jesus. The promise is fulfilled and manifest in the person of Jesus. And we become recipients of those things by what? Faith in Christ and what He has done. Let's read that again. But the Scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So we might actually see the promise of God, hold fast to the promise of God. Let me ask you this, Christian. How often do you forget the promise of God? How often do you forget this amazing story that has been provided to us to demonstrate the things that God has done on our behalf, that He has been working from ages past to this point in history? And how often do we forget the promises of God? Let me ask you this, when Trump got shot in the ear yesterday, how many of you were forgetting the promises of God? Man, I hope not. I hope you weren't. And I hope if our flesh was tempted for those moments to despair and be frustrated with the current political climate that we sit within, that you would run quickly back to the promises of God and go, He's got it. He's got it. It is not as though God is standing there wondering what's going on. Our God sits in the heavens and He does what? All He pleases. God is not caught off guard by this. And where is my hope placed? I hammer this one a lot, friends. Don't weary in it. But our hope is not in politics. Our hope is not in wealth. Our hope is not in, in our technological advances. Our hope is not in our health care system. Our hope is not in my ability to, to work or to earn. My hope is in Christ and Christ alone. He is my rescuer. He is my Savior. He is the one who is going to make these things right. And I am going to trust in His goodness and hold fast to His promises that all the families of the earth will be blessed through Him. The promises of the world that He has given. It's not just that we get to go to heaven one day, it's the fact that He is going to reign and rule on high, controlling all that there is as the glorious Lord and King over all. The promise of His rule, the promise of His reign, the promise of His supremacy, the promise of His preeminence, the promise of His power is what we are resting in. And that I get to be there in His kingdom with Him as He rules. I think sometimes we preach such an emaciated gospel that we don't see the promise that has been given to us. The promise to Abraham and his offspring was actually for the world that we would become heirs and co-heirs with Christ, ruling with Him. It's an unimaginable promise. And we let little things that go in day in and day out rob us of the joy of the promises of God and the salvation that He has given us. Friends, don't let your joy be robbed. Don't let the promises of God fall flat on your ears. Don't let them be something, yeah, I know that, but we got this going on right now. It should be the other way around. I had to rebuke my own heart last night as I'm sitting there reading and rereading the Scripture, begging God, all right, Lord, I know this is here. This is what we're doing. This is where we're going. Why do I feel like this is so impotent? Because you got this going on over here, and my flesh was strong. And yet by faith and by asking God's grace, He's brought me back early this morning to this place where I can rejoice and go, no, this is more significant. This is more important. The eternal, God, eternal plans of God in salvation history are far more significant and impactful than anything that goes on in the news cycle. Than anything that goes on in our day-to-day -day life. Who are we grasping to? Who are we holding fast to? By God's grace, it's Him. 
Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. It was our tutor. It was something that, again, demonstrated our need. The law was never put there to keep us in bounds and keep us doing all the right things that God may go, all right, I'm happy with you guys. You did good enough. The law actually exists and imprisons everything, and it's a terrible master, but it was a master nonetheless that helped show us we need God. And it existed until Christ came and goes, here I am, follow me. And so we are no longer under the guardianship of the law, but we have Christ and we are in Christ and we are set free from the law of sin and death and given to Him as His. I actually praise God for where we're at in the story of redemption. I praise God that we're on this side of the cross and not that side of the cross. Because in the time of the law, they were looking forward to Christ and the things of Christ. And now what are we doing? We're looking back to Christ and the things of Christ, remembering the promises of God. But I don't have to submit to the law and the things of the law in the same way that they did as the guardian hung over top of them, imprisoning them. I have a different relationship to the law, which we'll get to. I really want to start into what is really another sermon here. Um, I'm, I'm going to avoid it. I'm going to avoid it. I want us to hold fast to the purposes here. The law exists to show us to show us what Christ has done and that we are justified by faith. Faith in His promises, faith in His work. But now faith has come and we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Who are we and whose are we? How many times have I said that? We are sons of God by faith. We have been made His. We have been brought into the family. We are regarded as His people. We hold fast to whose we are and who we are and where we are at. We no longer have the guardian, but it's in Christ Jesus that we are what? Sons of God through what? Faith. It's not my performance that makes me a son of God. It's not how good I can be. Because there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ. What does this promise do? Well, it makes the foot of the cross level, as some like to say, the old Baptist phrase. Right? It places us all in the same place spiritually. All in the same place of need, and all in the same place of provision. Christ has provided for us, and we are all one in Him. It brings us together. I was very sad to miss last week. The Lord's table, I love the Lord's table. I love participating with you guys in that time. I love the union that is present there. How we together are proclaiming in our symbolic action what Christ has done for us and who He is to us. And we are knit together and demonstrably showing that we are all one in Christ. That He is ours and we are His and we are one another's. The promise knits us together like this. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. I don't want you to be deaf to this phrase that I'm going to say and I'm going to keep saying, whose are you and who are you? I am heirs of Christ. I am an inheritor of the promise of God. What He has promised in ages past is something that I am a recipient of and will be a recipient of, and I hold fast and cling hard to that. Christian, where are you clinging to? What are you holding to? I know it's really easy to ask it, and even in the moment, it is easy to go, yes, I, I cling to Jesus, I cling to Jesus. Let me ask you this, what is your plan for when you walk out these doors? When you leave here today, what is your plan? 
Are you just going to let it go by the wayside? Are you just going to let it fall to the ground? Are you going to be like so many? God, that guy liked to yell. I was out of hand. Right? Or some others. I was so nervous that he was going to step off the front of the stage. That was just too much. Right? I've been told that more than once. Brian, we're just really worried about that. You know, I need a handrail if I'm not going to go over. I will, it'll happen eventually. I promise. Just wait for it. You want to be here for that Sunday. It'll be entertaining. I promise. Are we going to allow the cares and concerns of the world? It's so hot. Right? It's ridiculously hot. It's out of control. It's not Texas hot. That was miserable. But it, it's still too much. Right? What other things can distract you? They will. Our world likes to inoculate itself with alcohol and drugs and various other things. It likes to, to numb the pain and the things by doing actions that take us away from what is important and significant. And you know what? The, one of the worst things that we do? Where is it at? Can't be too far from it. I'll go into withdrawal, right? This evil little device. How many things distract us? How many things pull us away? How many things keep us from holding fast and clinging to the message that was just preached from the Word? How many things keep me from actually going and studying myself? A relatively difficult passage that has great gold and jewels inside of it for your very soul. What is your plan? What are you going to do? My hope and my prayer for you is that you would not just leave this and forget. That you dig deep into the Word of God and draw nearer to Him. That when the things of the world assail you, that you would be already clinging fast to Christ. Because see, that's the thing. If I'm not already clinging to Christ, when the storms come, I'm going to have a hard time finding them in the sea. I'm going to have a hard time finding them as the waves toss me to and fro. But if I'm already holding fast to Christ, if I'm already clinging to Him, if I'm already encouraging and being encouraged and strengthening my brothers and sisters of Christ as they strengthen me, guess what? I'm going to hold fast to the rock. I ain't letting go. So brothers and sisters, where are you at? What is your plan? Because when many of us leave here, there's going to be broken relationships that we're going back into. A husband or a wife a mom or a dad, siblings or neighbors that, you know what? We feel more like enemies than family and friends. There's going to be circumstances that you go out and enter into. Cancer becomes a real reality. Health issues become huge. Brokenness are things that are going to show up. And what are you holding fast to? My friends, I pray and I hope that it's Christ that we hold to and Him alone. Cling tight to our Savior and King. And if you don't know Jesus, grab a hold of Him. If you're like, oh, He says that all the time. I mean it all the time. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Him as your Savior? Do you follow Him? Do you cling to Him? Is He yours? Have you rested in His goodness? Have you given a public testimony of your faith in Him through the waters of baptism? Have you submitted yourself unto the church and its membership? Grab a hold of them today. Don't wait. Because none of us are promised tomorrow. Not one of us. I could walk out this door and die right now. I could die of a heart attack right now. Actually, that'd be great. It'd be terrible for you, but I'd be into it, right? Just die right here. You know, go out with my boots on. At the end of the day, my friends, grab Jesus. Father, we thank you for your goodness, and I thank you that we can gather in the name of Christ and that we can look to the promise of God and hold fast. That we can see from ages past He has made these plans and these promises that are found, fixed, firm in Jesus. And the things which He promised will come about. I pray that as we leave this building that we would not allow the cares and concerns of the world to choke it out, to draw us away, to cause us to forget. But having the mind of Christ, may we take thought or take all our thoughts captive and subject them to Christ. 
Help us now, please, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.